get to the study of by one another, encouraging one another, and the key to the teaching of the Lord. That's the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Okay, so initially I was supposed to cover chapters 1 through 6 on Sunday morning, and I thought 7 through 12 tonight, and then it hit me. Second Corinthians is a baker's dozen. There's 13 chapters in that book. So I had an idea, because I didn't see me cramming eight chapters in tonight if I could only get through five on Sunday morning. And I messaged Adam and I said, how about this? What if I cover four of the chapters that are left on Wednesday and the other four Sunday morning, and that will spare you teaching class, so all you have to do is focus on your sermons. And he goes, that would be perfect. I was like, great. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to get to uh, pump the brakes just a little bit. Not a whole lot, but, but just a little bit. So by way of review, is it on? It is on. You have the themes that are laid out for the epistle. Chapters 1 through 7 deal with the ministry of preaching the gospel. Chapters 8 and 9, which we'll get into this evening, uh, deal with the ministry of benevolence. And then the rest of the book deals with Paul's apostolic ministry defended. And actually, like I said, Sunday morning, that's really kind of a theme throughout the epistle. He really kind of does that uh, in places along the way. But I think the bulk of it really occurs in the latter chapters. So we covered chapters 1 through 5. We got down to being reconciled to God. Tonight we're going to cover the chapters that deal with being holy, true repentance, patterns in giving, and principles for giving. So when we left off Sunday morning, what was chapter 5 dealing with? Back it up for a cheat. Okay. But the chapter really concludes dealing with being reconciled to God. And Paul stressing that, uh, especially in the final verses, if you look at beginning in verse 18, he says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteousness, become the righteousness of God in him. So, Paul is really stressing this relationship uh, and that, that the Corinthians need to be mindful of that. How come? Was Corinth a problematic congregation? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. And we see that in, in 1 Corinthians. Uh, another one of the reasons I like 2 Corinthians is, are, are they a perfect congregation? No. Have they made improvements? Absolutely they have. And Paul recognizes that, and he praises them for that. And he still gets a little heavy-handed with them because there are some areas that they really need to concentrate on and really need to focus on. 
But above all, what he wants to stress is that the importance of being reconciled with God is far and above the most important thing that they need to be mindful of, always. And he stresses that, how has that reconciliation come to us? How do we take advantage of it? Through Christ. Well, what did Christ do? Right. And he says he made him who knew no sin to be sin. Christ assumed all the burden of that guilt of our trespasses and our iniquities, right? So I touch back on that because chapter 6 seeks immediately off of that. When he talks about being holy in this chapter, he's stressing that. In the first couple of verses, he says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. What's he stressing? Yes, yes. There is no time like the present. Take advantage of it. You need to act on it now. Don't delay. Uh, one of the, probably I guess like the third sermon I ever preached, I titled it Behold. And I went through and took out passages in the New Testament where it does that because the word behold means pay attention, take notice, look here, listen up. And I got to preach that over in Grenada where my dad was at the time. And afterwards he came up to me and said, you know, he goes, every single one of those verses you've used, he goes, I've used those for years. And he said, I never thought of stringing them together to make a sermon out of. And I was like, huh, cool beans. And I always had the idea, you know what, I'm going to go back and do the same thing with some of the verses in the Old Testament. I never did. My dad did. <laughs> I found out later. I need to find that sermon. That'd be fun to go through. But, and, and that's not a phrase that we hear now. That, you know, ever tell anybody, behold, car's coming, get out of the road. We don't use that. You know, wouldn't be wrong to, but. I like the fact that he stresses that. And that, no time like the present was applicable then. It's applicable today. It will be applicable tomorrow. And I think that we who are Christians, we often forget that when that should be part of what motivates us to spread the gospel. Because there's people out there in the world that need to know this is the acceptable time. This is the day of salvation. You need to act on it. But we all get a little lax, don't we? I'm, I'm, I'm guilty. Then he goes on in verses 3 through 5, and like I told you Sunday morning, and we're fixing to get into a lot of them, Paul is a lister. And you'll find that even more so when we start getting into Galatians through Colossians, the shorter epistles and stuff. It's like Paul feels stressed to touch on so many topics and to drive home so many points. And one of the best ways he does it is he makes little lists of things. And so he, he does that more so in this book here, I think, than he probably did in 1 Corinthians. But beginning in verse 3, he says, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings. Is it easy as an apostle? 
being a minister of the gospel? No. Absolutely not. And while I think ministers today probably don't suffer quite the same amount of trepidation that comes along in all these categories, I think they do experience and experience them to some degree. And even as individual Christians, we experience these things to some degree. But that sounds very disheartening, doesn't it? Wouldn't it be easy to be discouraged if you were felt like you were constantly running into a wall, meeting opposition, that people were ungrateful to hear the gospel message? I think so. So how did they do it? Well, verses 6 through part of verse 8. He says, they did it by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and by good report. Seems like he has a wealth of things to tap into to help him deal with this gamut of problems that ministers face, doesn't it? Uh, I think it's especially uh, notable to point out the fact that he states by the Holy Spirit, but also by the power of God. You would kind of think that would be one and the same, but apparently... Those are distinct resources that help him deal in this. By purity, he's not, uh, the counter to that is at the end of the verse when he says, by sincere love, some of your translations may say without hypocrisy. So he's not motivated by any selfish gain. He's not motivated hoping to be noticed, to become famous or renowned for what he's doing. That What he does, he does without hypocrisy. He does it out of purity, out of sincerity. And he does it by honor and dishonor. He starts drawing some contrasts here in verse 8. By honor and dishonor. Did Paul ever do anything dishonorable? No. And, And the thing is, it's those hearing the message would be the ones who would determine if if his motivation was honorable or dishonorable, and it's not. He also says by bad report and by good report. Did Paul's reputation get slandered? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's how some people probably knew him. The Apostle Paul, look out for that guy. But also by good report, by people who actually knew him. There's the Apostle Paul. You need to go talk to him. He can explain the gospel to you. He can settle this matter for us over this issue that we're having. It's not easy. And I think a lot of times these things that he mentions that serve as resources to help us as Christians, like he lists to help these ministers of the gospel, I don't think we tap into them. I don't think we take advantage of them like we should. Then he goes on to contrast how they're viewed spiritually. Uh, The latter part of verse 8, he says, As deceivers, yet true. As unknown, yet well known. As dying, and behold, we live. As chastened, and yet not killed. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making rich. As having nothing, yet possessing all things. As an apostle, as as a minister for Christ in this day and age, does that seem like a sound career choice? No, 
Not if you're motivated by the pleasures and comforts of the world, it doesn't. And Paul's not. And so when the typical person looked at them, they looked poor and destitute. They may seem like a sad lot. They had nothing, often, except a few supplies and the clothes on their back. From a physical standpoint, in a physical sense, it doesn't seem like somebody you would want to imitate, does it? But from a spiritual standpoint, which is where Paul places his emphasis, it's rich beyond measure. Possessing all things, as poor but making many rich. Not about making himself rich, it's about making others rich spiritually. Always rejoicing. And we know in a lot of times Paul has mentioned some of the things he suffered, he was happy to do that. He rejoiced in being able to suffer for the cause of Christ. That was his mindset. Dying, yet we live. Chasing, yet not killed. To me, that's hard to stay upbeat when people are trying to kill you and people sought actively to kill Paul and other apostles. But he's still upbeat about it. Still rejoiced in being alive. And he took note of the fact, I'm not dead yet. Not yet. Comments, questions? Yes, ma'am? Yeah. That's right. Okay, beginning here, Paul really draws a contrast between what it means to be holy and what it means to be unholy. Uh, verse 11, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You're not restricted by us, but you're restricted by your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, and what part of, has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of God, of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. One of the things that always aggravates me uh, regarding this passage of Scripture, as, and you've probably heard people make this, make this point, is a lot of times people want to go here to justify uh, the fact that only Christians should wed among themselves. That's a good practice. You would think it would cut down on your odds. But even marriage between Christians isn't always perfect. And Christians can make mistakes. And Christians can sin and become unrepentant and wind up divorced. And wind up going in an errant way. That's not what this passage is talking about. It's talking about wedding the gospel with paganistic philosophies, 
wedding the Christian life with living a worldly life. That's the distinction that he's making, especially as he gets down here toward the end. What is Christ with Belial? What part has a believer with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? You remember in the Old Testament when God took Israel to be his people, what did he say to them? Right, because of that corrupting influence. That applies here. But more specifically, how did he, what was his entreaty to them? Right, it was the exclusivity of that relationship. I will be yours, you will be mine. For that to happen, they were to be a separate people. They were set apart for him, but they were not to intermingle because of corrupting influences. What he's stressing here is to be holy, they can't intermingle with corrupting influences as far as the gospel goes. Yes, sir. Right. Right. And you think too, in regards to if he's if he was talking about an actual marriage between believers and unbelievers, and, and that's why people apply that, being yoked, don't be unequally yoked. That's not what he's talking about. Think about what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 when he addressed the topic of marriage there. And some of those Christians were wed to unbelievers. What did Paul tell them to do? Stay in the marriage. It's still sanctified in the eyes of God. And you never know, you might win your spouse over. So I'm going to get off my hobby horse now. But that just always irks me. All right, one of the neat things I think he also does is, so he cites three passages in the Old Testament, and actually he kind of paraphrases them. I, I went back and looked at the passages, and I'm like, that's not exactly what that says. But Paul sort of paraphrases them for, for the gist of them. But he speaks about the Almighty as God, speaks of him as Lord, and he speaks of him as Father, which I think is neat. And then here's what he stresses, and this is very reminiscent of what God told his people in the Old Testament, and this is where it applies to being holy or being unholy. I'll be their God, they'll be my people. The exclusivity of that relationship with God. Come out, be separate, don't touch what's unclean, and I'll receive you. And then lastly, I'll be a father, and you'll be my sons and daughters. A spiritual family. They need to keep these three things in mind, because it will help to impress on them that they need to maintain their reconciled state with the Lord. It should also spur them on to encourage others to take advantage of the gospel so they too can be reconciled to the Lord. All right, comments or questions on that? Chapter 7, dealing with true repentance. And the first verse uh, says, But having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Everything he just spoke about in chapter 6 should spur that desire on, to be cleansed from our filthiness, 
perfect and to perfect our holiness. There's a duality to that, and you have to do both, right? Uh, he speaks in verse 4 uh, he, uh, about his, Paul's greatness. He's not bragging on himself. Uh, he says, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my boasting on your behalf. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Paul's bragging on them, which seems odd considering the fact that a lot of times he's kind of having to give the Corinthians the business to get them to straighten up. In this sense, he's actually bragging on them, and uh, he's glad to share in their tribulation. Uh, he speaks of his trip to Macedonia and the results of it. How did that go? You know, Paul was eager to go to Macedonia. Not good. I mean, there were some highs and lows, some goods and bads. He said they faced conflicts outside, fears inside. I've always wondered exactly what he was implying with that. Uh, I mean, was that literal? Was that figurative? Was that within the church there? Or was that within the community in regards to him? But who turned out to be a big help for him? Titus. Titus' coming brought what for Paul? Comfort, consolation, he had friendship, camaraderie. Here's a neat thing that dawned on me today in prepping through this. We get like a little character bio, so to speak, of Titus in this book, and I don't think I've ever realized that. Paul mentions him many times, and the good that Titus does, and the heart that Titus has, and spreading the gospel. And I don't think I ever realized that. And Paul takes great consolation in the fact that he's got Titus as a fellow worker and that Titus is a trustworthy fellow worker. Paul can give him responsibilities and Titus will take care of them. Titus will see to them. And uh, I think that's... I think that's pretty neat. Uh, Paul had mixed regret at having to write them, but he rejoiced at their repentance. Uh, if you look there in verses 8 through 10, he says, for even, I made, for even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret it, though I did regret it. And that sounds a little confusing. I think what he's saying is he regrets having to resort to that. It's not something he wanted to do. It's very much like a parent telling a child, I didn't want to get on to you, but I'm kind of glad I did because I like you a lot better now because you're behaved. And nobody likes to be scolded. Nobody likes to have their feet held to the fire, but sometimes it's necessary. And Paul goes on to point out that it had the, de the desired results, and I think the Corinthians realized that themselves. He says, For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us if not in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not repentance leading, uh, leading salvation, not to be regretted, but sorrow of the world produces death. Do you like for people to make you feel bad? I mean, when you're in the wrong, do you like for people to point that out and make you feel bad about it? I don't. I hate that. Dawn will bust my chops sometimes. And, well, 
I say bust my chop. She is so gentle with spirit, I don't think she could really bust my chops if she wanted to. But she means well. But we don't like it. Nobody likes to be told they're in the wrong. When we take it with the proper heart, we don't get angry. We get sad about it. We get regretful. It should make us want to change. That's what the gospel message does. That's its intent. It's to bring about godly sorrow, to make us realize how we've offended the Almighty God. To make us realize that we need to humble ourselves. We need to repent. And we gain salvation by doing that. But sorrow of the world, that's rebellious. We try to make a comparison between what we have to stand through Christ, what God offers us, and the pleasures of the world. And there are some people that they just cannot give up the pleasures of the world. Even it seems like sometimes there are people that convert, but they are they're like Lot's wife. They're always looking back. And what winds up happening? A lot of times they start drifting, and they go back. Paul doesn't, inf- doesn't flat out say being unrepentant, but that's inferred. And the end result of that is death. Nobody wants to die, but it seems like there's a lot of people that don't want to deny themselves and humble themselves and repent in genuine sorrow for having offended our Creator. The products of godly sorrow, he says in verses 11 through 12, for observe this very thing, that you sorrow in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things, you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote to you, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done wrong, nor for the sake of him who suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. So the converse of feeling this sorrow, of being repentant, you go through that process and you come out of it, what do you strive to do? When you first become a Christian, how do you feel? You feel fresh and new, you're rejuvenated, you're excited, you're eager, you're diligent about your Bible study because you want to learn You want to know, you want to grow in understanding, you want to mature. Clearing of yourself, you begin to feel, any of you ever feel a sense of indignation when you see the behavior of the world and the people around you? I do. Do you ever feel a sense of indignation about yourself because of the way you used to behave when you look back and you think about things like that and shake your head? and say something like, I can't believe I used to be that person. Fear, vehement desire, zeal. Who knows the difference between vehement desire and zeal? I don't. That sounds like the same thing to me, but I like That just sounds neat to me. And vindication. Vindication. A lot of times we use the word justified or justification. But our vindication will come when the day of the Lord arrives. We're steadfast in our faith. We will be vindicated for that. Paul shares the joy and comfort and refreshment of Titus because of the Corinthians' obedience and reception of him. And this gives Paul confidence and them in everything, in the concluding verses. And uh, 
you, you see the reputation that, that Titus has. Uh, the Corinthians were eager to accept him, and they seemed to enjoy him. All right, comments, questions on chapter 7? We'll go to 8. Patterns of giving. Paul cites the example of the Macedonian churches in verses 1 through 5. What was the example of the Macedonian churches? Gave out of their deep poverty. They weren't just poor, they were poor. I mean, they couldn't put their hand in their pocket and rub the lint together. But they were so eager to be a part of the work to, to lend aid to brethren that they had never even met. But were in more dire straits than they were. And they wanted to be a part of that. And I love verses 2 and 3. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they they were freely willing in their giving. And you look at that, you've got... Affliction seems like it would be something that would put you off. It doesn't. It seems to spur them on. So there's an abundance that abounds from them according to their ability, beyond it. I have no earthly idea what the economic state of those churches or individuals in Macedonia was. But I imagine these people gave until it hurt them. Because it was that important to them. But how was that accomplished? They gave themselves to the Lord first. That is primarily the driving factor. Because I doubt anybody would have just given as they had give, just out of altruism. They gave themselves to the Lord first. And then, by His will, to others. They recognized the benefits that they had in the Lord. They wanted to share that in any form or fashion that they could, especially to brethren who were in dire need of it. Uh, he says in verses uh, 7, he says, But as you abound in everything, in faith, and speech, and knowledge, and all diligence, and in your love for us, see that you abound in this grace also. This is what he's stressing to these Corinthian brethren. But notice this. Here's things that we should abound in, and this is one of those little mini lists that Paul just sticks in there. We need to abound in our faith, in our speech, in our knowledge, in all diligence, in love, in the grace of giving. Those are a lot of things to be busy abounding in. And we need to be mindful of those things. Uh, how would one abound in speech? Teaching? How about just making a point to bring up God or Jesus in daily conversations with people? Whether they're your brethren or whether they're not. And if you're going to talk about God, if you're going to talk about Jesus, what's a good thing to have? Knowledge. Yeah. It never comes off well when we just kind of shoot from the lip, does it? And diligent, demonstrating love, the grace of giving. So he draws a, a metaphorical contrast of Christ's spiritual richness and physical poorness. 
How does he state that? Yes. He was rich, but he became poor. So that out of your poverty, you could become rich. I love that sort of dichotomy. I think that's really neat. What is Paul's advice to the Corinthian brethren? Finish the job. Apparently... Uh, they had been made known about this, and they were eager to participate. They wanted to do something. And it's rocked on, and it's a year later, and what have they done? Nothing. Or maybe Paul's reminding them of that. But he stresses that they need to be busy about that. And he uses this quotation in verse 15, as it is written, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. And I think one of the points that he's driving home to them is that it's like a spiritual sort of supply and demand. There are going to be times when brethren in another area have the supply, but can meet the demand of brethren somewhere else. Like say in a time of a natural disaster, or something like that. Or if you've got a congregation that's budding, but we need to support a minister to keep someone in that area, to keep the work going and growing, but the members there themselves can't really afford to pay the man. We can do things like that. Because it's reciprocal. You may never know at some point if the congregation you're in or that you become a part of is going to be a congregation that is in need. That will look to and, and maybe rely on other congregations for some sort of assistance or help or aid. It's completely applicable, and he's reminding them of that. Uh, again, he mentions Titus in verse 17, verse 23. says he's diligent, he is self-motivated. I think we need to take note of that. And Paul vouches for him. Uh, he says in verse 23, If anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. How would you like to have Paul say something like that about you? I think it's good that we can say that about one another. Aren't we fellow workers here? Absolutely. Maybe we need to use our speech and be a little more appreciative. Uh, he also mentions a mystery brother. Uh, not sure exactly who that is. He's praised and chosen by all the churches to travel with Paul. So there are some scholars that think maybe he's speaking of Luke. Uh, and then there's mystery brother number two, who has proved diligent and became more diligent as a result of Paul's confidence in the Corinthians. And there are some who think that maybe he's referring to Apollos there. I really, I couldn't tell you. All right, chapter 9, principles of giving. Paul essentially says in verses 2 through 4, we shame not only ourselves but others who have confidence in us when we don't fulfill our promises. That almost seems like a verbal, you all need to do better. You said you were going to do this, do that. His boasting of the Corinthians' willingness has stirred up zeal in others. The Corinthian congregation, they're going to do this. They're gathering their funds, and it's going to help out these people. And 
Well, we want to be a part of that too. Well, great. How are you Corinthians coming along? Uh, we're not ready. No. No, that doesn't look good. Doesn't look good on Paul. Doesn't, it really doesn't look good on them. Uh, he says in verse 5, uh, Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time. Now, I think that's nice. He doesn't want to publicly embarrass them. He's giving them a heads up. To go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand that you have previously promised and that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Giving should never feel like a grudging obligation, like something we just have to do. We should be happy to do that. We should be happy to support God's work in any way that we can, to support Christians in any way that we can in accordance to his word. He says in verse, uh, he, he uses the analogy of sowing in verses 6 and 7. If you sow sparingly, well, then you're going to reap sparingly. But if you sow plentifully, bountifully, well, you're going to reap in that same measure. So don't be stingy. Be gracious. Don't be grudging. Be willing in your giving. Uh, verses 8 through 11. I particularly like this because this all toward the end of the chapter, it really focuses on God, the giver of every good and perfect gift. And here's what he stresses. God is able to make all grace abound, and thus there's an abundance for every good work. God's able to supply not only the seed, but multiplies it to the increase of the fruits of righteousness. God is able to enrich in everything for all liberality and causes thanksgiving through the Lord. Here's what we've got to remember. When God enriches us, when God causes us to abound, we're meant to share that. We are expected to share that. That's part of our duty. The dual purpose, verse 12, is that the supply, it supplies the needs of the saints, and it abounds through many thanksgivings for the Lord. Our giving, as God has blessed us, those who receive that causes them to bless God also, to cry out in thanks to Him. They glorify Him. It's not about us. We may be the giver. But God gave to us. We are passing his blessings along to them. And thus we're thankful to God and the recipients, the benefactors of that. They bless God. And finally, he says in verses 13 through 14, God's glorified for three reasons. Obedience to the gospel of Christ, a liberal sharing of all men, and prayers on behalf of of the exceeding grace of God in them. And that fits perfectly with our theme for the year. It's all about him. He, Paul concludes this on giving with the fact that it's all about God. Thank you very much. We're out of time, and we will wrap this up Sunday.